A's are 239, the nays are 160. The bill is passed and without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? I ask unanimous consent to remove all co-sponsors from H.J. Resnick 2. Without objection, so ordered. Sorry. Democratic Caucus. Gentlemen will suspend. The chair lies before the House of Communication. The Honorable, the Speaker, House of Representatives. Sir, this letter is to notify you that as of close of business today, I am resigning as the ranking member of the Committee on Ethics. Signed sincerely, Zoe Lofgren, Member of Congress. Without objection, the resignation is accepted. The chair lies before the House of Communication. The Honorable, the Speaker, House of Representatives, Sir, this letter is to advise you that effective today I am taking a leave of absence from the Committee on Small Business until my tenure on the Committee on the Budget is completed. It is my understanding from Clause C of Rule 19 of the Democratic Caucus Rules referenced below that I will continue to accrue seniority during the leave of absence at the, at the same rate as if I had continued to serve on the Committee on Small Business. Rule 19, Clause C, any member of the Committee on the Budget shall be entitled to take a leave of absence from service on any committee or subcommittee during the period he or she serves on the Budget Committee and seniority rights of such member on such committee and on such committee to which such member was assigned at the time shall be fully protected as if the member had continued to so serve during the period of the leave of absence. Accompanying this letter is a letter from the Democratic leader verifying that my seniority on the Committee on Small Business will continue to accrue during my absence. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Signed sincerely, Heath Schuler, Member of Congress. Without objection, the resignation is accepted. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Democratic Caucus, I offer a privileged resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Resolution 62 resolves that the following named members be. Mr. And are Speaker, hereby. I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be considered as read and printed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. The resolution is agreed to, and the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Pursuant to Clause 11 of Rule 10, Clause 11 of Rule 1, it, and the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair announces the Speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Mr. Rippersberger of Maryland, Mr. Thompson of California, Ms. Joukowsky of Illinois, Mr. Langevin of Rhode Island, Mr. Sheff of California, Mr. Boren of Oklahoma, Mr. Gutierrez of Illinois, and Mr. Chandler of Kentucky. Pursuant to sections 5880 and 5581 of the revised statutes, 20 U.S. Code 42-43, and the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair announces the Speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution. Mr. Johnson of Texas and Mr. LaTourette of Ohio. Pursuant to 22 U.S. Code 1928A, Clause 10 of Rule 1 and the Order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair announces the Speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the United States Group of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Mr. Turner, Ohio, Chairman, Mr. Shimkus of Illinois, Mr. Schuster of Pennsylvania, Mr. Miller of Florida, Ms. Emerson of Missouri, Ms. Granger of Texas, and Mr. Bellarakis of Florida. Pursuant to Section 4A of House Resolution 5, 112th Congress, and the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair announces the Speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the House Democracy Partnership. Mr. Dreyer, 
Chairman of California, Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska, Mrs. Biggert of Illinois, Mr. Conaway of Texas, Mr. Buchanan of Florida, Mr. Bustani of Louisiana, Mr. Wilson of South Carolina, Mr. Roscom of Illinois, Mr. Crenshaw of Florida, and Mr. Diaz Ballard of Florida. Pursuant to Section 201A2 of the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1974, uh, to US, sex, uh, U.S. Code 601, and the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair announces that the Speaker and President Pro Tempore of the Senate hereby jointly appoint Douglas W. Elmendorf as Director of the Congressional Budget Office for the term expiring January 3, 2015. The Chair will entertain requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? to address the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, this week, January 23rd to 29th, is National School Choice Week. Earlier this week in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, students, parents, and legislators from both parties in varying walks of life from across the Commonwealth gathered to rally for school choice in the state capitol. Every day, tens of thousands of children attend schools where quality education is not being offered. Meanwhile, those that defend the status quo claim that if we just do more of the same, at some point schools will improve. Mr. Speaker, throughout the laboratories of democracy in this great nation, concerned parents are moving forward with a different vision, which is better for our children. So as we continue in this new 112th Congress, let's make a commitment for America's parents that they will not be forced to send their children to low-quality schools without other choices. Let's provide parents with options, whether they're public, private, charter, home, or cyber schools, for the education that's the best fit for their children. Children don't have the luxury of waiting for change. For today, students, reform only works if it takes place while they're still in school. I commend those back home that are standing up for our children, and I'll do my part here in Washington to support their efforts, not just this week, but always in order to ensure that each child has the opportunity to live up to his or her individual learning potential. Gentlemen, I yield time back. Has expired. Gentlelady from Texas. Without objection, so order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, a few minutes ago, this House voted to eliminate uh, one of the anchors of democracy, allowing Americans to check off on their IRS filing form $3, just $3, uh, to promote and support the democratic process of electing the President of the United States, all in the name of deficit reduction. But deficit reduction doesn't work without a plan. It doesn't work without thinking about the many state departments of transportation who can no longer fix uh, the highways uh, and freeways in your community or to promote uh, rail mobility in order to take cars off the road or, in fact, to keep the doors of community colleges open or to support primary education while state legislatures are struggling uh, to find resources to provide for teachers and students. So let me say this. I want to work with you on deficit reduction. In fact, I've done it before, but not without a plan. And I believe that investing in the infrastructure of America is a plan that will allow jobs to be created. That's the serious way of dealing with moving America forward, allowing for the genius of America, having a plan that responds to building America and not making false projections about saving money. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. For what purpose does a gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to honor Sheriff James A. Alderdon. Sheriff Alderdon served as Sheriff of Larimer County in my congressional district from January 1999 until his recent retirement on January 10, 2011. Sheriff Alderdon served the state of Colorado in various capacities prior to becoming the sheriff in Larimer County. Resume includes time working for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, Colorado State University, the Police Department, as well as the Steamboat Springs Police Department. His career is a shining example of dedication to the state of Colorado. In addition to having a great sense of humor, he's a leader. He has great respect and gives his colleagues great respect. Sheriff Alderton would incorporate all employees into the decision-making process by giving them the respect and authority they deserve to identify problems and to correct them. As his lasting legacy, he implemented the police department's motto of serving with the acronym PRIDE, which stands for professionalism, respect, integrity, duty, and empowerment. Sheriff Alderton embodied these virtues throughout his career. 
He also personified those virtues on a personal level. It's my great honor to stand here on the House floor honoring Sheriff Jim Alderton and thank him for his service. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there any further one minutes? Seeing none, the chair lies before the House a personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Doyle of Pennsylvania after 1 p.m. today. Without objection, the request is granted. Pursuant to 15 U.S. Code 1024A and the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the chair announces the speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the Joint Economic Committee. Mr. Brady of Texas, Chairman. Mr. Burgess of Texas. Mr. Campbell of California. Mr. Duffy of Wisconsin. Mr. Amash of Michigan. Mr. Mulvaney of South Carolina. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that today following legislative business and any special orders heretofore entered into, the following members may be permitted to address the House for five minutes to revise and extend their remarks and include therein extraneous material. Mr. McDermott, Washington. Uh, Mr. Green, Texas. Al Green. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, uh, Florida, Ms. Wolsey, California, Mr. Higgins, New York, Ms. Kaptur, Ohio, Mr. DeFazio, Oregon. Purpose is a gentleman from Texas rise. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that today, following legislative business and any special orders heretofore entered into, the following members may be permitted to address this House, revise and extend their remarks, and include therein extraneous material. Mr. Pitts for today for five minutes, Mr. Royce for today for five minutes, Mr. Fortenberry for today for five minutes. Without objection. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Keep the House for one minute. Chairman. Gentlemen, is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, as elected officials, all of us who serve in this chamber have the honor of representing our constituents in public service. And as elected officials, we are also fortunate that some of our best and most able Americans choose to serve their nation and their communities by working in our office as congressional staffers. In my office, I have a staffer who is leaving that I wanted to recognize here today. Mike Weehy first began working for me when I served as mayor of Dayton and has continued to work for me and for the best interest of his community for the greater part of 12 years now. Mike is a native of Salina, Ohio and a graduate of Salina Senior High School and from Wright State University. He's held literally almost every single position in my office, having served as scheduler, communications director, legislative assistant, military legislative assistant, legislative director, acting chief of staff, and finally district director and director of military affairs. He has excelled in each of these roles by always performing his job well and leading his fellow staffers by example. Mike's last day in the office will be January 31st. I ask my colleagues to join me in thanking Mike for his tremendous service and huge sacrifices that he has put in in public service. Mike, we wish you all the best in the near future and in your endeavors. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011 and under a previous order of the House. The following members are recognized for five minutes each. Mr. McDermott, Washington. What purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, President Obama gave a stirring speech last night, most of which I agreed with especially the calls for defense cuts, the investments in innovation, education, and infrastructure, and the elimination of oil company subsidies. But given the sacrifices endured by the American people, I thought Afghanistan got short shrift, a mere two paragraphs. The American Prospect magazine described the State of the Union as a ride past the wreckage. I think that was because it applies to the, it's the State of the Union's uh, treatment of Afghanistan. Because the fact is that the training of Afghan security forces has been slow and ineffective. The Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction said as much this very week. The Taliban remains a vital force in many pockets of Afghanistan, and the head of the Afghan NGO Safety Office reports a very precarious security situation. The President was correct when he said that Afghanistan will need to provide better governance, 
But it's hard to see that happening with President Karzai regularly lashing out at us and at one point saying he would choose the Taliban over the United States and the international community. Mr. Speaker, the American people are tired of being talked down to about this war. Tired of being told everything's fine and under control. Tired of being urged to stay the course. Tired of talk about progress that seems to be little more than an illusion. The President reiterated last night that we will begin to bring our troops home in July. But there's plenty of evidence to suggest we're ramping up this war instead of winding it down. Earlier this month, for example, 1,400 additional Marine combat forces were deployed with the possibility of additional mini-surges during the spring that would push our troop levels in Afghanistan to the 100,000 mark. We're also using heavily armored tanks for the first time, and there are reports that we're considering expanding the war across the border in an unprecedented way with risky and dangerous special operations ground raids into Pakistan. Does this sound like a war that's drawing to a close? Then in a trip to Afghanistan a few weeks ago, the Vice President suggested to his hosts that the occupation could extend beyond 2014. He said, we're not leaving if you don't want us to leave. He should check out recent polling that indicates the Afghan people's deep skepticism, if not downright hostility, regarding the United States military presence in their country. Besides, what about what American people believe? When are we going to respect their point of view? They're the ones paying for this war in blood and treasure, and clear majorities believe that this war has outlived its usefulness and is not worth fighting. It's time, Mr. Speaker, to listen to the American people. There's only one sensible and humane solution. That's to bring our troops home and bring them home now. I yield back. Mr. Poe of Texas. Get a little closer to me if you would. The question mission address the house for five minutes. Recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, on Christmas Eve 2010, about a month ago, most of Americans were with their families and their friends enjoying the holiday season, the joy and happiness of, of being together at that special time of the year. But holidays do not come for peace officers. They work all the time, especially on holidays. One such officer was Ann O'Donnell. She was a University of Houston police officer. She liked to call herself Unit 429. And she was on patrol December 24, 2010, about 1 o'clock in the morning. She had responded, the first to respond, to a possible kidnapping in the Houston area. And she sped to the scene, but her vehicle went out of control. She crashed, and she was killed. This is a photograph of Officer Ann O'Donnell. 24 years of age. Her father, Jim O'Donnell, who was close to his daughter, normally talked to his daughter sometime between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning, those nights that she worked. On this day, this Christmas Eve, he received no such phone call from his daughter. You know, uh, Ann was a resident of Houston, Texas, and, a, and Galveston, Texas. She had been a peace officer for only 13 months. And she loved being a Texas police officer, and Mr. Speaker, she was good at it. She is the daughter of Nonette and Jim O'Donnell. Her father, Jim, said about his daughter, Anne will never experience the joys of marriage, having her own children, to cherish and to grow by her example. As a father of four kids, three of them daughters, three of them about the si same age as Anne, I understand the close relationship between a father and a daughter. That is a special relationship. <clears throat> but no parent wants to lose their child before their time. 
and was a compassionate police officer. She not only arrested the bad guys, once she arrested <coughs> an underage minor for an alcohol offense. So rather than send this child to detention, she called the parents and got the parents involved in this child's life. She was from Ball High School in Galveston, Texas. She went to the University of Houston and Galveston College. And in her youth, she learned from the Galveston County police officers about being a peace officer. She wanted not only to capture outlaws, but to help the good people of our communities. Mr. Speaker, police officers are the last strand of wire in the fence between the fox and the chickens. And Officer O'Donnell was one of those officers. They, like Ann, uh, do society's dirty work, and they go and serve and are first responders to public safety. Ann was such a person. Ann was the 252nd female police officer killed in the line of duty in this country since 1796. Already this year in 2011, 14 police officers in our country have given their lives for the rest of us. Ann died protecting and serving the people of Texas. And at Ann's funeral, 500 police officers paid her honor in the rain. Harvey Rice of the Houston Chronicle said it best about her funeral. Officers filed out of the church while the bells tolled, Hark the herald, angels sing. The officers reformed ranks and stood at her attention again in the rain as the casket was carried down the steps and placed in a black hearse. At the cemetery, the rain-drenched officers again gathered as a riderless horse followed the casket to the gravesite and bagpipes played Amazing Grace. Officers fired a 21-gun salute, and two buglers paid, played taps. Amazing person, this officer Ann O'Donnell. We admire her and thank her for being a Texas peace officer and for her life that she gave for the people. We mourn her loss, but Mr. Speaker, we are grateful that such a person as Officer O'Donnell ever, ever lived. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I rise today with a heavy heart to also honor uh, our first responders killed in the line of duty. Two brave South Florida police officers shot and killed just this past week. Miami-Dade County veteran detectives 41-year-old Roger Castillo and 44-year-old Amanda Hayworth died last Thursday while protecting the community they loved. As part of a fugitive task force working with the U.S. Marshals Service, officers Castillo and Hayworth were members of a professional elite unit whose mission is to go after violent career criminals. Last week, they were attempting to arrest one such violent criminal. They were hunting a fugitive suspected of murdering another man simply for raising his voice with the suspect. When police on, knocked on the door of a home where he was believed to be, the suspect opened fire, killing officers Castillo and Hayworth and injuring officer Deidre Beecher. Combined, officers Castillo and Hayworth dedicated 44 years to serving the citizens of South Florida. They put their lives on the line every day to make us safer. And last Thursday, these two heroes made the ultimate sacrifice. We lost them to a senseless act of violence by someone with a total disregard for the lives of others. We grieve their loss, not only to the community they served, but to the families and loved ones they leave behind. A 21-year veteran on the force, family members say Detective Roger Castillo loved two things in this world, his family and his job. His wife of 15 years, Debbie, also works as a police officer. Officer Castillo leaves behind his three sons, 14-year-old Anthony, 11-year-old Michael, and 9-year-old Brian. A dedicated father, neighbors said that he was the kind of dad you'd see on the front lawn tossing around a football with his boys. Amanda Hayworth spent 23 years on the force. A neighbor says the only thing she loved more than her job was her 13-year-old son, Austin. A single mom, Amanda Hayworth would never miss her son's baseball games and would often practice with him in their backyard. Amanda Hayworth was the first female detective ever killed in the line of duty in Miami-Dade County. While I did not have the good fortune of knowing these two detectives, I know this. I know these were two exceptional individuals taken from us and lost too soon. These were incredible parents, ripped from their families before their time. They were excellent public servants trying to make our community a better place to live. 
We send our thoughts and prayers to heal their families. To their families and loved ones, I struggle to find words that can offer solace and comfort in your time of distress. The great poet William Wordsworth once said, not without hope we suffer and we mourn. Perhaps he meant that we find hope in the belief that our thoughts and prayers will in time heal their families, and in the hope and belief that the children of Officers Castillo and Hayworth will grow up knowing that their parents made this sacrifice to make their world and our world a better place. In the meantime, we will suffer and mourn. After going through our own senseless tragedy with our colleague Gabby Giffords, we share in the pain of senseless loss and inexplicable violence. Officers Castillo and Hayworth will be forever in the hearts of our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady's time has expired. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, how did the 20-year war get started? It had been long assumed that the United States government, shortly before Iraq invaded Kuwait in August of 1990, gave Saddam Hussein a green light to attack. A State Department cable recently published by WikiLeaks confirmed that U.S. Ambassador April Glasby did indeed have a conversation with Saddam Hussein one week prior to Iraq's August 1, 1990 invasion of Kuwait. Amazingly, the release cable was entitled Saddam's Message of Friendship to President Bush. In it, Ambassador Glasby affirmed to Saddam that the president, this is in quotes, the president had instructed her to broaden and deepen our relations with Iraq, close quote. As Saddam Hussein outlined Iraq's ongoing border dispute with Kuwait, Ambassador Glasby was quite clear that, quote, we took no position on these Arab affairs, close quote. There would have been no reason for Saddam Hussein not to take this assurance at face value. The U.S. was quite supportive of his invasion and war of aggression against Iran in the 1980s. With this approval from the U.S. government, it wasn't surprising that the invasion occurred. The shock and surprise was how quickly the tables were turned and our friend, Saddam Hussein, all of a sudden became Hitler personified. The document was classified supposedly to protect national security, yet this information in no way jeopardized our security. Instead, it served to keep the truth from the American people about an event leading up to our initial military involvement in Iraq and the region that continues to today. The secrecy of the memo was designed to hide the truth from the American people and keep our government from being embarrassed. This was the initial event that had led to so much death and destruction, not to mention the financial cost these past 20 years. Our response and persistent militarism toward Iraq was directly related to 9-11 as our presence on the Arabian Peninsula and in particular Saudi Arabia was listed by Al-Qaeda as a major grievance that outraged the radicals who carried out the heinous attacks against New York and Washington on that fateful day. Today the conflict has spread through the Middle East and Central Asia with no end in sight. The reason this information is so important is that if Congress and the American people had known about this green light incident 20 years ago, they would have been a lot more reluctant to give a green light to our government to pursue the current war, a war that is ongoing and expanding to this very day. The tough question that remains is, was this done deliberately to create the justification to redesign the Middle East as many neoconservatives desired and to secure oil supplies for the West? Or was it just a diplomatic blunder followed up by many more strategic military blunders? Regardless, we have blundered into a war that no one seems willing to end. Julian Assange, the publisher of the WikiLeaks memo, is now considered an enemy of the state. Politicians are calling for drastic punishment and even assassination, and sadly, the majority of the American people seem to support such moves. But why should we so fear the truth? 
Why should our government's lies and mistakes be hidden from the American people in the name of patriotism? Once it becomes acceptable to equate truth with treason, we can no longer call ourselves a free society. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the President for his message last night. And I especially would like to focus on one aspect of the message. The President indicated to us that sitting together was important. It has great symbolism, and it's a positive thing. But he also indicated to us that this is not the final step in the process. Sitting together can never, never replace working together. So it is what we do today. Last night he said tomorrow. Sitting together tonight is important, he indicated. But working together tomorrow, this is where we have to focus our energies and efforts. We must work together. And if we're going to work together to fulfill what I believe is a great challenge, and that is America first, to make America number one. If we're going to make America first, America number one, we absolutely have to focus on education. Education is important because the jobs as we go forward will require much more education than we have been allowed to have and have good jobs in the past. We must focus on education to have the good jobs that we want. And jobs are a priority for all of us. Some statistical information is available to help us better understand why we need to focus on education. Currently, about 25% of our students are completing high school. Over the next 10 years, half of all new jobs will require more than a high school education. If we compare our 15-year-olds to 15-year-olds around the world, we find that we are 20th when it comes to science literacy. China is number 13, Korea 3. The U.S. is number 28 when it comes to mathematics literacy among our 15-year-olds. China is number 1, Korea number 3. The U.S. is ranked 16th when it comes to reading literacy among 15-year-olds. China is number one, Korea number two. We must focus on and maintain an educated workforce. An educated workforce requires that we understand that we have to have quality teachers and that we are going to have to make sure that these teachers will invest in education themselves because they see it as a means by which they can have a livelihood. I understand that most teachers don't teach simply because they want money. They teach because they want to be with children and they want to see children learn. This is important. But teachers have to feed their families too. I support making sure that teachers get a decent day's pay for a hard day's work. I support teachers and making sure that the teachers are available to educate our children. If we're going to have America first, we have to have a first-rate health care system. We had a great sickness care system. We were among the best when it comes to sickness care. We spent $100 billion a year treating persons in emergency rooms, in facilities outside of primary care facilities. But if we're going to be number one, we had to move away from the $2.5 trillion that we were spending annually on health care, which translates into $79,000 a second, 17.6% of GDP, and by 2018 it would have become $4.4 trillion per year, more than 20% of GDP, $139,000 a second. To have America first, we've got to educate our people, and we've got to have them uh, receive quality health care. Quality health care can never be underestimated because of the way it impacts the workplace. America can be first. I stand for America first. I love America. And I stand here today to say to my colleagues across the aisle that I am willing and ready to reach out and work with you to help make America first. Because if America is first, not only is the United States a better place, but the world will be a better place because of the values that we hold so near and dear to us. We believe in liberty and justice for all. We believe in government of the people, by the people, for the people. We believe that every person ought to succeed on his merits or fail on his demerits. 
That's what America gives to the world, the notion that there is a fair system that allows anyone to rise to the top, to reach the zenith of life, the best that life can offer. We take this to the world, and I want America to be first so that the world can benefit from what America has to offer. Thank you, Mr. President, for your message, and I assure you I have taken the challenge that you have accorded us. I will work with others to make sure that we get beyond the symbolism of sitting together and move to working together, which will make the difference in the lives of the people in this country and indirectly the people around the world. God bless you, Mr. President, and God bless the United States of America. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today with a heavy heart to remember and honor Corporal Eric M. Torbert, of, Jr. of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. On December 18, 2010, Eric was killed by an explosion while conducting combat operations in the Helmand province of Afghanistan. In 2007, Eric displayed his willingness and enthusiasm to serve and defend his country by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps at Paris Island, South Carolina. He was then assigned to the 1st Combat Engineer Battalion, 1st Marine Division, 1st Marine Ex Expeditionary Force, Camp Pendleton, California. He deployed to Afghanistan in October of 2010. Eric understood what it means to live a life with purpose. He served a cause greater than himself. He served the cause of liberty. Eric gave his life to bring hope to all freedom-loving people, as did many Marines before him in the 1st Marine Division. Activated aboard the battleship Texas on February 1, 1941, the 1st Marine Division is the oldest, largest, and most decorated division in the United States Marine Corps, with nine presidential unit citations. Eric has joined this storied tradition of service and excellence. Before deploying to Afghanistan, Eric married Marcel L. Sebastian on June 12, 2010. Marcel supported Eric when he joined the Marine Corps in 2007 and throughout his entire career. Her steadfast care and sacrificial love for Eric and our nation deserves our sincerest gratitude. Eric was a leader. He was a caring husband, a friend, a son, a brother, and a devoted member of a local band. He leaves behind family and friends proud of his service and his distinguished career in the military. Eric earned a number of awards during his service in the Marine Corps, which demonstrates his commitment to our nation and his professionalism as a Marine. His personal service awards include the Purple Heart, Combat Action Ribbon, National Defense Service Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, Afghanistan Campaign Medal, and the Sea Service Deployment Ribbon. May God grant to Eric's family the peace that surpasses all understanding. We grieve their loss. Our prayers and most heartfelt gratitude go out to them, and I offer them my deepest condolences. I'm humbled by the dedicated service and sacrifice of their loved one. Eric's valor and service cost him his life, but his sacrifice will live on forever among the many dedicated heroes this nation has called to defend freedom. He joins the revered ranks of the many thousands of men and women throughout American history who have given their lives to secure the freedom of the people of the United States of America and the freedom-loving people around the world. He is an inspiration to us all. Semper Fidelis, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last night, uh, the President spoke to Congress and to the nation about the need for increased funding for biomedical research, both to improve the quality of life of our nation's citizens, but also to generate new economic investment. He is right and we must heed his call on this initiative. Cancer research is a vital part of our nation's biomedical research enterprise, but our federal commitment to this promising field has not kept up with the rapid pace of scientific innovation. In fact, when you take into account medical inflation, our funding commitment to the National Cancer Institute and the National Institutes of Health 
have actually been cut over the past seven years. We can and must do better. We will only see new promising cancer the therapies that increase survival and life quality through a sustained multi-year commitment of federal funding for cancer research. There is only one failure in cancer research. It's when you quit or you're forced to quit because of lack of funding. When, fed, when federal fund, cancer funding is cut or not sustained over the long term, we lose not only promising cancer research, but we also lose talented cancer researchers. President Nixon recognized this 40 years ago when he signed the National Cancer Act. At that time, less than 50% of cancer patients lived five years beyond their diagnosis. Today, with advances in early detection, healthy lifestyles, and new cancer therapies, the survival rate is 65% for adults and 80 percent for kids. That would not have happened without a significant investment in federal research funding. The National Cancer Act led to a continued sustained investment in cancer research that funded the research community to develop a new generation of smart drugs that help thousands of cancer patients every single day. Smart drugs are highly targeted to attack fast-growing cancer cells without damaging healthy cells. Drugs like Herceptin for breast cancer, Avestin for lung cancer, Gleevec for gastrointestinal stromal tumors inhibit or block cancer cell growth. In fact, less than 10 percent of cancer deaths are attributed to the original tumor. It's when cancer metastasizes, when it grows, when it advances to a vital organ, the cancer becomes lethal. All this could not be more important to the community that I serve in western New York. Buffalo, New York gave the nation and the world Cancer research from the New York State Cancer Laboratory was first established by Dr. Roswell Park in 1897. Roswell Park Cancer Institute continues that mission today, and the research, research put out by doctors has led to many breakthroughs that alleviate suffering due to cancer every single day. Roswell Park is one of 40 National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer centers around the country that are the engine for our nation's war on cancer. An important part of the Buffalo and Western New York future relies upon the success of research completed at Roswell and companies at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus coming to market, creating new small business, businesses and high quality jobs. If we don't have a sustained investment in cancer research moving forward, the promise of that research and the jobs that it will create will be lost. The time to act is now. Cancer is estimated to cost our nation $263 billion in 2010 alone, according to the National Institutes of Health. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support a renewed commitment to cancer research because there is no better time than now. Alleviating suffering and death due to cancer in our lifetime should not only be Congress's goal, it should be America's goal. And we should insist on a huge federal investment uh, toward that goal. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Without objection, the gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to City of Hope, a renowned biomedical research and treatment center in my district. On January 13th, City of Hope reached a milestone few in the world have ever achieved. Doctors performed their 10,000th bone marrow transplant 34 years after they completed one of the most successful transplants ever, and it was the first. But this is more than just another milestone. This is a time to remember the thousands of children and adults who have benefited from City of Hope. Patients like Rodrigo Nunez, a Mexican immigrant who, at the age of 17, became ill. After a transplant and the kindness of the community, he graduated from college. He has proudly spent over two decades as a nurse at City of Hope. Please join me in congratulating City of Hope for their achievement and wish them luck on the next 10,000. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution uh, 1, 112th Congress, I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye.
Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. Pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1, 112th Congress, the House stands adjourned until 2 p.m. on Tuesday, February 8, 2011. The House has gaveled out for the week, but before leaving, members passed a bill that ends taxpayer financing of presidential election campaigns and party conventions. All legislative work for the week has now been completed. The chamber is out of session until Tuesday, February 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can follow.